Hello, welcome to Introduction to SPSS. My name is Johnny Lin. I'm one of the consultants here at UCLA's IDRE Statistical Consulting Group. This video was initially recorded on October 26, 2020, but because of some technical difficulties, we had to re-record. But we spliced the two videos together, so you have the full contents available here in this video. So th we thank you for your patience because this is one of our first times transitioning all our seminars and instruction to online due to the COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, we hope all is well with your family uh, and yourself and thank you for your time. And we hope you gain some valuable information here in this video. So the first thing uh, we're going to go over is really just how to access the web page and all the content from the web page. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And what we're going to do first is just to access the website itself. So the website is located here in the URL, https colon two four slashes stats dot idri dot ucla dot edu forward slash spss forward slash seminars forward slash notes. Now, if you didn't get that, you can either pause the video or I'm going to show you another way to do that. Okay. So another way to access the video or the website is to go to our homepage. Now you can uh, start with a search at UC, uh, UCLA IDRI Statistical Consulting and you'll find our webpage, stats.idri.ucla.edu. Then you're gonna go to resources and you're gonna click on seminars. You're gonna go down, scroll down and, until you see SPSS. And then you're gonna click on introduction to SPSS. So all the class notes are available as a website, um, but I've created a PowerPoint specifically for this seminar here. So under data files for the class, you can download the slide deck here. So I'm just gonna click on that. And that's gonna open up a PowerPoint file for you, which looks like this. Okay, so you will be able to see this slide deck if you open up the file that I just downloaded. Next, you're going to open up the zip file, which has all the content uh, other than the PowerPoint. So I'm going to show you on a PC, but um, there is an analogous way on the Mac, which I will not show you. Um, but it's basically opening up a zip file and extracting it to a folder. So I'm going to download the zip file by clicking on this. I'm going to open a file. And this is in Windows 10. I'm going to click Extract All. Where am I going to extract it? I'm going to extract it C colon forward slash temp. And click Extract. And there are all my files there. Now I have one more remaining file to download, and that's called missing.sav. I'm going to right click. Save link as, this is in Microsoft Edge. You can perform this also in Chrome or Firefox or Safari. Now I wanna download it into the C colon for slash temp folder. So I can just type that in here or I can look for it in my PC, go to the C drive, click on temp. So just note that I created this folder. You can download it to any folder you want. For example, um, you can download it to the My Documents folder if you want, okay? Uh, you don't have to download it to the same folder. And those are all the files you need for the seminar. I'm gonna close out the web page. Now, most of the um, information for the remaining seminar will be available in the PowerPoint. Okay. So I'm just going to go over briefly 
an outline of what we'll be talking about here today. So the objective of the seminar is to show you common data management utilities in SPSS to facilitate your data analysis. So uh, this is not um, a seminar on how to analyze uh, your data statistically. Uh, we will be providing seminars in the future on how to do that. And if you have any comments on that, feel free to just email us at idristat at ucla.edu for more feedback. Now, the reason why we uh, use SPSS usually is um, it's great for people who like to focus on the point and click interface. Uh, SPSS does have a, a syntax version of every command, but the strength of SPSS definitely is in the point and click interface. So it's great for beginners who are just starting out, for example, in Excel, and they wanna to transition to a more powerful statistical program. Now there are other programs that are more powerful than SPSS even, including R, but um, in terms of the learning curve, if you've never used R, it's much more difficult to learn something like R because it's completely command-based versus SPSS, which uh, I would say a lot of, or almost 80% of the commands you can do over point and click. There are commands that are not available for point and click, but um, definitely you can do most of what you need in SPSS with the point and click. So in regards to that, we're gonna be talking about the point and click environment, um, just to get you familiar with basic elements of SPSS in terms of the graphical user interface. We'll be talking about how to enter in data into SPSS. So just importing data, saving data as a SPSS format, and uh, we're gonna be talking about how to run some basic descriptive analysis to understand your data once you get that data in. But sometimes the data you receive isn't really the way you want it. And we're gonna talk about how to change your data or modify your data so that um, it is in a form that you, 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 you actually need. And then finally, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna be talking about how to manage data so for example, reducing your data set down, we're gonna be appending data, merging data. And these are all basic functions that you need to run a data analysis in SPSS. Now we're not going to show you statistical analyses. So uh, the requirements of SPSS are that you need a Windows or a Mac PC. What we're gonna be focusing on today is SPSS uh, 26. Now, if you have version 22, I believe, or higher, I believe all of the commands still work. Uh, we can't guarantee that it'll work the same for versions lower than 22. If you are UCLA um, affiliated, I think, you will be able to access SPSS for free if you don't want to purchase it via the Click Virtual Desktop and the link is available here. You can also search Click C-L-I-C-C -C, Virtual Desktop on Google uh, at UCLA on Google and you will be able to find this link. This is a remote server that you can access uh, where you can uh, log in and access multiple programs such as SPSS. You can even access uh, other programs that are not usually free like Stata or um, M plus, for example, or SAS. So as I told you, um, this is where we download the SPSS files. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the SPSS environment file, but the main file is that zip file. So we're going to go over the SPSS environment. There are about uh, five things, uh, main things that we want to talk about, which is the data view, the variable view, syntax editor, the command syntax itself, and then the output viewer. So basically four main elements of SPSS and then one uh, thing that uh, is pretty important, but we won't go over, which is the command syntax. So the first thing you want to do is open up SPSS. So what I'm going to go do is I'm going to start sharing my screen here. So 
So if you already have SPSS installed in Windows 10, I'll be going over how to do that. Um, I like clicking on the search and then I type IBM SPSS. So I do see um, that we have version 27 installed. Again, uh, the class notes should apply to any version of SPSS that's at least version 22. So don't worry if you have the latest version, you don't have the latest version of SPSS. Um, the notes and the processes still will apply. So I'm gonna click on SPSS 27. This takes a while to load up. So you'll be met with this welcome to IBM SPSS statistics window. I typically don't like using that, but um, if you want, you can re, uh, use this uh, menu system. But I just click on don't show this dialogue in the future. And then I close. So you'll be met with a window. This is called the data view. This is the first thing you'll see when you open SPSS. And for those of you who are familiar with Excel, this looks very similar to Excel. What you'll have first is the variables down the columns, and then you will have the observations down the rows. So I'm going to show you how to open your first SPSS file. You can go to File, and then click Open, and click Data. So File, Open, and Data. So I'm going to type in C colon forward slash temp, and that's going to go to my C temp folder. So you notice that these are all SPSS files. SPSS files end with .sav. So I'm going to open up something called hs0.sav. This is just a prompt saying um, SPSS is running in Unicode encoding. You don't need to worry about that. I just click yes. OK, and there you have your first SPSS file. So you notice, like I said, the variables are down the columns and the observations are down the rows. So you will notice these kind of uh, iconographs next to the variable name. And I'll go over that in the following view, which is called variable view. I'm going to click on the tab next to data view, and that brings up variable view. So this is the second most important view in SPSS. Now, instead of row, uh, variables down the columns, we're going to have variables down the rows. This makes it easier if you have a lot of variables in SPSS. Here we know we have 11 variables. Now the name is important because it tells you uh, what the name of the variable is. You just want to make sure you don't start any variables with numbers or special characters. In general, I would avoid special characters in SPSS naming. For example, don't I don't think you can put in a space in gender. So don't do that. Don't add spaces uh, to variable names and try to keep your variables short and under eight characters if possible. And that's, a, that's an old kind of uh, rule, but uh, having short variable names is always preferable. The type column tells you whether this is a, a numeric variable or a string variable. A numeric variable is what you usually want to have. So you notice that gender, even though it's male or female in this case, um, we call it numeric because uh, it is labeled either one or zero. Okay, so you, you typically wanna have every variable as a numeric. The other type of variable is called string. So you typically wanna avoid string variables, but for the purpose of the seminar, we'll be showing you how to deal with them. Um, but you can't analyze most uh, data in SPSS as string variables. So you wanna make sure you can code it into numeric. So you typically wanna have numeric variables. Now we're gonna go over to the column called measure. This is important and it's unique to SPSS um, graphical user interface. You won't see this in the command interface or in the command syntax. But you're gonna see something called nominal versus scale. What is a nominal? A nominal measure is something that is categorical. So uh, if you're looking at fruit, you know, you have oranges, you have apples, you have grapefruit, okay? Whatever fruit you like, these are nominal variables because the number underneath them don't mean anything. I could easily switch 
orange one and grapefruit two to orange two and grapefruit one, and it wouldn't change the underlying meaning of the measure. Scale, on the other hand, the number does matter because first of all, it's ordinal, meaning one is less than two. Now scale allows uh, non-discrete values, like for example, 1.2. So this is appropriate if you have continuous variables, what we call continuous variables, like height or weight. Now here we have reading scores, for example, or writing scores or math scores. We're gonna assume these are scale variables. There's another type of measure called ordinal and we won't be covering that, but they, basically these are discrete but ranked values. Like for example, one, two, three. These are appropriate for what we call count variables. Like things you can measure with your finger, like one, two, three. We're not gonna go over ordinal variables in the seminar. So the two main ones you wanna really keep in mind are nominal and scale variables. Now, for nominal and scale variables, there is a difference in how you treat them because scale variables don't need values. So I'm looking at the value column, but nominal variables do. The reason why is because if we have an underlying numeric type for a categorical variable, you're not gonna know the representation of it unless there's something called a, um, a value label. So here, if we click on values for race, we're gonna see one equals Hispanic, two equals Asian, three equals African-American, and four equals white. Now we'll go into this in a little more detail later, but this is important if you have a nominal variable with an underlying numeric type. You'll notice that uh, math, science, social studies, right? These variables are scale and they don't have value labels, okay? So typically you don't need value labels for scale variables, but you will need them for nominal variables. Now the variable label is this column here and that's very important in general. Now you wanna have variable labels so you know what um, the variables mean. So you can have short variable name, but a long variable label. Variable la labels, you can add spaces, you can add uh, special characters, but these are basically a code book for you, to, for you and someone else who hasn't seen the data before to know what your variables actually are. So I highly recommend adding variable labels. We are missing a couple of variable labels here, but I do recommend adding them. Now the width and the decimals are, are not as important, but uh, especially with modern computers, you can have uh, the width of that column be as long as you want. In the olden days, this was uh, useful if you had limited memory. But in general, we want at least eight you know, spaces for the width at least. And then decimals are appropriate if you have scale variables, you know, uh, it's how many digits you want to round the decimal point to. So decimal two means I, I can round it to 10.12, for example. And decimal zero means I round it to 10. So I would say these are not as important um, with n decimal. The last one I want to briefly mention is a line. You will notice that um, numeric variables are right aligned and string variables are left aligned. So that's something to uh, keep in mind when you see it in data view. Role is not important and we won't be talking about that. This is for uh, some more uh, recent kind of command or, or uh, graphical user interface options that we won't be going over today. So that's variable view. Okay, and we'll be going over in detail how to kind of change your data up uh, using variable view, but you wanna be mostly in data view and then sometimes hop over to variable view. So you'll notice that measure uh, does appear in the data view. Uh, you can see that gender is nominal. ID is scale. Typically we don't really want ID to be scale, but here it's scale. Now you notice that um, program type is also nominal because we see that Venn diagram, but it has a special 
A character here. And that symbolizes that it is um, a string variable. And you notice that it's left line, meaning the first level uh, character appears on the leftmost side of the column. And that all the other variables are right aligned meaning that the last digit is aligned with the right column. So that just quickly identifies which ones are numeric type and which ones are string type. Lastly, you know, notice that there is missing data. For example, uh, ID 84 or observation nine, we have missing data in the science uh, variable. So missing data in SPSS is coded in a special way with, with the dot. It's called system missing. We will be going over a little more about that. So those are the two main variable and data views. Okay, Those are two main views that you'll be looking at when you use SPSS. The next thing I want to show you is called the command syntax. Uh, Okay, so going back to the slides. So going back to the slides, we just went over data view and we went start here. So going back to the slides, we just went over data view and variable view. Now we'll be going over the syntax editor. So this is what the syntax editor looks like. I'll show you how to open that up using SPSS. We're gonna go back to SPSS. We're just gonna go new and syntax. New, file, new, and syntax. So this is the syntax editor. Now this is uh, the antithesis of the SPSS GUIs. So this is where SPSS started with the command syntax. Now, everything you do in the menu system can be translated to the command syntax. So I'll just show you very quickly how to do that. We're gonna start, go back to the data view here. We're gonna analyze. I'm going to descriptive statistics and we're going to descriptives. We're just gonna click that option right there. I'll explain what this is later, but let's say we wanna get some descriptives for reading. We're gonna drag that reading over to the right variables column. Now you'll notice you can click either okay, or you can click paste. I'm gonna click paste here and show you what that does. Okay, now we're going back to the syntax viewer. So notice what just happened. We basically generated syntax from the menu system. So what this says is basically activate the data set. And then this command is descriptives. What variables are we describing? Read. What statistics are we getting? The mean, the standard deviation, the min, and the max. So that's not exactly what we want. We want to first highlight this command and we're going to click run selection. And there you have it. You have the descriptives now in the output viewer. Okay, so this is called the output viewer. This is where all the analysis will go when you run the commands. So those are the basic four basic elements of SPSS. We, won't, we, know, we went over data view, we went over variable view, the syntax viewer, and then the output window. Now, for those of you who, who want to know more about SPSS command syntax, you can access the full reference available as a PDF. You can go to help, you could go to command syntax reference. I'm going to click on that and it should open up a PDF file. Okay. So I'm going to look up descriptives. And let's see.
start here. They're going to the help and then documentation in PDF format. Start here. So we're going to the help and click on documentation in PDF format. Start here. So for those of you who want to know more about the command syntax, you can go to help and click on command syntax reference. Now it's gonna open it up in my browser. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna search up descriptives, okay? The command I just ran and Okay, and then uh, it is on page 573, I believe. I could just click on this and it'll take me to the appropriate place in the PDF. So I'm gonna zoom in. And this tells me that basically descriptives is a command that is available in the base edition, which I have of SPSS. So the basic syntax is descriptives variables equals variable name. Now, anything in boxes is just optional. Now you see these bold star star, those are default option, okay? So basically, uh, start here. So descriptives is available in statistics base edition, which I have, which everyone should have if you own SPSS. There are um, other modules that may not be available unless you purchase some upgrades. But uh, basically the way to read this is, this is the command, okay? And then this is what you need to specify after the command, the equals, after the equal sign. Basically it wants you to specify some variable names. You only need one variable name, everything else is optional. So the box, the, the square brackets are optional. Now, anything with a forward slash is a subcommand. So this is called the missing subcommand. And also for the options within the subcommand, it says double star means the default if subcommand is omitted. So if I omit missing subcommand, then the default is missing equals variable, which means I'm going to exclude cases variable by variable rather than what we call list by solution, which excludes everything. Um, so it excludes, list wise means that you exclude the observation if any of the variables you included in the analysis is missing. The statistics subs command is what we kind of uh, looked at before. And the default is mean, min, standard deviation, and max, right? Those are the ones we kind of were looking at before. So if I excluded statistics, I will get the same thing. And start here. So the last subcommand is tells us that if we remove sort as a subcommand, it's going to sort it. Start here. So if you look through the PDF documentation, it'll say that if you remove the sort subcommand, then what it's going to do is just going to sort it by the 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 order in which the variables appear in SPSS. Now, if you do include the sort subcommand and you don't include an option, it's gonna sort it in ascending order, which is the A, and then it's gonna sort it by the mean. Okay, unless you sort, uh, ask it to sort by something else like the standard deviation. So juxtaposing the syntax viewer 
and the PDF, we will see that um, this is exactly what is required, the descriptives command in blue and variables in red equals the var name, which is read. Now we excluded missing, which means it's going to exclude variable wise. And we, we excluded sort, which means it's going to sort it by the, the way the variables appear in the variable view. Now, if we exclude statistics, the statistics subcommand, what is it going to output? So we can try that. Remember, anything in a box is optional. So we can simply copy and paste the command. I put control C and then press control V to copy and paste. All we need is things that are not in boxes, which is descriptive variables. Let's see what happens when we do that. Okay, so we just ran the command and we are going to the output viewer. Okay, you notice this is the command I ran, descriptive variables equals read. And it basically gave me the same output, why? It gave me the minimum, the maximum, the mean, and the standard deviation because that was the default here, okay? The mean, minimum, standard deviation, and max. I believe diff default gives you the sample size. So basically what we did was a shorthand version of the same syntax. So I'm not gonna go over uh, too much in detail over the syntax anymore after this, but just so you know that the syntax viewer exists in SPSS and that you are able to access the syntax by pasting the command in the, uh, the graphical user interface of SPSS. Okay, let me go back to the slides. Now we went over syntax editor and we went over the command syntax reference and we went over output window. Now we're gonna go over how to enter data into SPSS. Okay, so uh, let's actually talk about uh, reading in Excel files. Since you are, a lot of you are familiar with Excel, okay? So I assume you've already downloaded the uh, file into your folder. Now, if you see the Excel, I mean, if you see the SPSS window, uh, you see this little folder icon here, that's also open. You can also go to file and open. Okay, when you click file and open, you click file, open data. Now I'm gonna show you that again with a yellow folder. Just click on that. Okay. Now, since I downloaded to the C temp folder, you know, it's right here. So C temp, you can find your folder here if that's not uh, the same folder for you. Now you're wondering, okay, where's my Excel file? Well, I thought I downloaded it. Well. SPSS will only list the files of the same extension that you list under files of type. So you're gonna click on files of type, the drop down menu, and then you're gonna to go to Excel. Now this is an XLS format. There is a newer format as of 2007 called XLSX. Um, but Excel will be, I mean, SPSS will be able to read both versions of files. And just double click. It actually makes it very straightforward. Honestly, a lot of things um, our default, and I just entered the default. The important one is read variable names from the first row of data. Make sure you have um, the first row is the variable names. If that's true, then you just click OK. And now you've downloaded the Excel file into SPSS. Now what's missing here? So what's missing are all the va variable labels, right? Where are all the variable labels? Well. If you download it from Excel, you're obviously not gonna have variable labels, okay? Uh, you're not gonna have value labels. That's something to think about, okay? It, it, uh, what format you want it to be in. Um, if, you, if you transfer from an external format, you're not gonna be able to retain anything in the variable view. Okay. Uh, now, another very common file is called a comma separated value. 
Okay, so what, what does that mean? A comma separated value is basically a text file, okay, where things are separated by commas. Now, what is the thing? That's called a delimiter. The, 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 the comma is called a delimiter. It basically uh, parses out, uh, you know, words uh, into separate words after in between the, the commas. So you have A comma B, it's going to say A and then B. Now, you can also have other kinds of delimiters, right? You can have tab delimiters. So that's called a tab delimited file. You can have like a period. But on, uh, uh, obviously, you don't want things that are letters to be delimiters, right? So if you had a delimiter be A, then AB is going to result in B, right? There's nothing because the A is the delimiter. So you don't usually want um, a letter to be a delimiter. You want something to be a delimiter that's like something that you don't use that often, like, like, a, like, a, like a comma, OK? So that's called a comma separated value. And honestly, every single program uh, I know of can read a comma separated value. Excel can read a comma separated value. SPSS can read a comma separated value. If you work with other programs like R or Stata, STAS, all of them use comma, are able to import comma separated values. So I highly recommend um, save, saving your uh, files if you want to work between programs as a comma separated value instead of an Excel file. Because not every program can read Excel. Okay. So how do you do that? Well, we're going to open. Remember, we're going to click files of type. Now this is called CSV, right? That's the extension. HSO.CSV. Now it's going to go through a list of all these things, right? It's going to generate a preview. It's going to ask you a lot of questions. You know, honestly, sometimes I just click through the default and it works, OK? So I'm, this is basically a preview of what it looks like. Notice you have the variable names at the top, and then you have the um, the data on the, uh, the second row. What are they separated by? Commas, right? That's how you know it's a comma separated file, V. How are your variables arranged and limited, right? We're delimited by uh, commas. Are variable names included? Yes, we have variable names at line one. Decimal symbols period. Now, a lot of Europeans use commas as uh, their um, kind of uh, decimal symbol, but here in the US, we use period. First case begins with line two, right? So there are some programs that cannot allow uh, variable names on the line one. Like uh, if you've heard of M, plus, it doesn't allow variable names on line one. But here, our variable name are, are on line one, and then our data begins at line two. Let's import all the cases. This is important, right? Which limiter appears between the variables? Commas, right? Now, if I uncheck commas, look what happens. If I uncheck commas, then there's no more delimit delimited um, del limitation, right? It just treats it as one file. Obviously, you want to check that. Now, if you check the others, it doesn't really matter because you don't have a tab as a delimiter, but you can also have a space or a semicolon as a delimiter. You can also specify your own delimiter, okay? But I don't recommend that. Uh, why? Because you want to be able to transfer between files, between programs. You want a uniform format, which is the comma separated value. You can, uh, as you import, you can change the name, you know, whatever you want. I wouldn't want to do that because um, these are all pre made data sets. I click next and I click finish. And there you have it. You just imported a comma separated file. Now you notice SPSS automatically codes the measure of the file. If that doesn't ring true for you, for example, I want ID to be nominal, I'm going to change that right here. You do notice that there is one string variable, which you didn't just talk about. Uh, string variable is basically a variable with all characters. Remember, that's different from the measure, though. It could be a string and a nominal, or it could be a numeric and a nominal. Ideally, when you do data analysis, you want numeric and nominal. Any questions about what I just did? Um, I am going to launch another poll. And ask if you're able to import your first file into SPSS. So you can say, yeah, it wasn't too bad. Yeah, but it took me a while to figure it out. Or no, I'm having some issues. Give me more time. Perfect. Very good. It looks like a lot of you are not having too much trouble opening files. That's perfect. 
And that's actually the benefit of SPSS, right? It makes it so easy to open files. What was the comma separated file you opened? It's called hs0.csv. I think there is only one. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna share the poll. So look, most of you, it wasn't too bad. That's actually one of the strengths of SPSS, okay? So um, if you've heard of something called stat transfer, which was um, a program that allowed you to exchange between pro, uh, different statistical programs, SPSS is like a really expensive stat transfer. Like you can pretty much open any kind of file in SPSS. Um, Andy, are you seeing my SPSS? No. No. Okay. So if you go to file yeah. open data, look at all the types of files you can do. You can do um, Excel, CSV, we went through that. SAS, you can do SAS. You can do Stata. It even has Lotus 1, 2, 3, which we never use anymore. Okay, so if you use these kind of um, software programs, SPS can open them. It's very powerful. So oftentimes I actually just use SPSS, open up some like Stata file and save it to another file, like a SAS file. That's how easy SPSS is in terms of transferring between files. Okay, so we've gone over that. Now let's open the uh, SPSS one, okay? So SPSS files are, um, the extension is SAV, okay? Andy, can you see my SPSS? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to open, I'm going to open hs0.sav. Now this is just like a Unicode thing. I'm just going to click yes. It doesn't really matter. And there you have it. That's your SPSS file. Now let's look at the variable view. Look, it retained the label, right? It retained the values. It retained the measure. If you imported that CSV file, I promise you it will not retain those. So let's say you have the SPSS, SPSS file you exported as a CSV. All that labeling is going to be gone. Okay, so you have to think about whether you really want to move away from SPSS. If there's things that you can do in SPSS, it's easier for you to just stick with SPSS. If there are things that you can't do in SPSS, do that thing in the other program. And then, um, but remember, most of the things you should be doing in SPSS if you start at SPSS. So. Think about some of the benefits of just using SPSS files instead of another kind of format, okay? Especially if you're working with SPSS. Now, another common feature as of, I believe, SPSS 26 is this import data feature. So um, we showed you file open. Now, how about this, import data? Okay, that's another, that's a newer feature. Um, I don't see a big difference, but um, for CSV, it does make a difference. So just a very small difference. So I, uh, this is an interactive seminar. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna start um, kind of talking about exercises. So this is the first exercise that we'll go into. Uh, Andy, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, perfect. So this exercise one is basically asking you to say, open hs0.csv and then save it as my hs0.sav. HS now use the import data feature instead of, instead of the file open data. What is the benefit of saving this as an SAV? So I'm gonna give you like maybe like three minutes to kind of start on it. And then I kind of, I'll show you myself, okay? so. I am on slide 16 in case you're following with um, slides. And again, you can ask any questions to Andy or Christine um, or just unmute your mic and ask me directly. Okay, so um, if you remember what we did before, like this is just one dialogue box instead of having to go through next, 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 right? The most important thing is first line contains variable names, right? Let's see if that even, delimiter, delimiter, comma. It's the same thing, right? Click OK. And then we've downloaded it. I mean, we've imported it. So you can pick, uh, you can play around with the import um, data wizard. Uh, and then just like 
see if there's any difference. I feel like with uh, CSV, it's a lot simpler because there's only one dialog box. Uh, can you guys list some benefits of using just SPSS or saving as SPSS instead of as a CSV? You can put in the chat window. What are some benefits of this saving it as a, why do I want to use an SPSS file over like a CSV file? Because uh, you can save the label and the values. Very good, very good, very good. Thank you, thank you. That's uh, very brave of you to unmute your mic, thank you. Um, but yes, um, remember SPSS has that variable view, right? Uh, Andy, can you see my SPSS? Yes. Okay, so SPSS has that variable view, right? So that's what's different between uh, Excel and SPSS, right? If you save it as an SPSS, you're going to retain all the, uh, the, the, the label and values, label variable, uh, value and variable labels, okay? If you export it as a CSV, you're not going to retain that, okay? So very good, um, but that's exactly why it's good to save it as an SAV file. This is basically what we call a code book, okay? All right, very good. Um, very good. Any other questions before we move on? So I'm gonna talk about quickly uh, how SPSS treats missing data. Cause it's kind of important. Um, so missing data is obviously like, okay, one participant didn't fill out something. Okay, so they have missing data. So if you look at SES right on the, on the column, on the second column here, You'll see uh, 186 ID has a missing value. That's signified by a dot. Now, um, let's go to the very last column called SCS2. That same variable, it's the same as the SCS variable, but it has a 99 instead of a dot. What is the difference between those two? Well, the SCS with the dot has what we call system missing, and the SCS2 with the 99 has something called user missing. So if you run some descriptors on those variables, you'll see um, missing system. You, um, you see that missing system. Uh, let's see if I can draw. Okay, so you see that right here, right? Missing system. Okay, and then here you see missing missing ninety nine. It's the same four, right? It's the same four that are missing. Why, why do you want user missing instead of system missing? Well, I can't personally see one for myself, except if you have different types of missing. Like for example, if someone has missing because they skipped the item versus someone who's missing purely because they didn't show up, maybe you wanna code that as a different type of missing. So you can code skip missing as 98 and then actual missing as 99. If you just use system missing, then you can only pick one. Now, what's the unique thing about STRSCS? So if you notice, there's a little, these are all nominal variables, right? Because we see the Venn diagram, remember the measure is all nominal. Now, what's the unique thing about this? It has an A. What do you think that means? So the A signifies that it's a string variable, okay? Now, SPSS treats string variables differently from, or from numeric variables. So here we have the same missingness, which is a dot. But if you go to the um, descriptives analysis, you'll see that this doesn't know that it's missing, right? Because if it did know it, it was missing, it would say missing and then system. So here we see a dot. What does that mean? That means SPSS treats a dot as, a, as another value, okay? Which is not what you want. So, in general, you want your variables to be numeric and you want to code either system missing or user missing. How do you know it's numeric? First of all, you won't see a character on the, the little A in the Venn diagram. Also, it's right justified. You see how the, the two is along this right kind of border here? Now look, look at the, um, the character one. Where is the two? 
it's not aligned on the right border. So that's how you know it's not a numeric variable. So in general, if you have numbers, code it as type equals numeric, not as a string. Because SPSS handles the missing data unexpectedly if you have character vectors or uh, um, variables. Any questions about that? So I'm going to go to our first true or false, OK? Uh, I am on slide 18. Um, so, oh, this is in my other. So I'm going to launch the poll again. This is a, our first kind of a assessment, OK, just to see if you kind of understood what I said. OK, so you. I'll just give you a couple minutes to kind of look over that. So the first question states for a numeric variable, system missing is represented by a dot and user missing is represented by a number. Number two, for string variable, system missing is represented by a dot. True or false. Number three, user missing allows multiple types of missingness where system missing allows only one type. I'll give you a couple minutes to kind of respond to that. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm gonna share the results. Okay, let's go through them. Okay, so for numeric variable, system missing is represented by a dot and user missing is represented by a number. That's true. You guys mostly got it. For string variable, system missing is represented by a dot. Remember, remember how I showed that slide that said when you had a dot, the descriptives didn't show missing. So for string or character variables, remember that A, that's false, okay? Number three, user missing allows multiple types of missing, whereas system missing allows only one. Yeah, that is true, right? System, user missing, you can say 98 or 99. For system missing, you can only say dot. Remember, this only applies for um, numeric variables. So any questions about the poll? I mean, the, the true false? Tony, there was a question about how yeah. do you make a syst, uh, user missing? Are you going to demonstrate that? You... Uh, I'm not going to demonstrate, but it's basically if you import it from another program or another file, it'll import it as missing missing blanks are going to be imported as that. Now you can also, if you create it with uh, SPSS, you basically hit delete. It's going to create system missing by default. No, no, user missing. Oh, user missing. Yes. You are um, Yes, I can show that. Yes, I think I will show that. If I don't show that, um, remind me. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So I think we're doing well. Uh, now let's get into the nitty gritty of exploring your data. We're going to go over how to explore your data. Now that you know how to import data into SPSS, let's take a look at our data set. So I'm just going to close out all these. So if you have a lot of data sets open, maybe there's a good time to just close them all out and start from scratch. I don't like a lot of windows open, so I'm just going to start from scratch. All right, so the first thing you want to do is open hs0.sav. Click yes. All right, so this is your, it's H, HS stands for high school. So it's some kind of high school data set with test scores, um, reading, writing, math, science, social studies. Um, this is kind of like the school, the type of school, the type of program, the race, the, um, the social economic status, and the gender. OK, these are separated by students. So it's just like uh, a hypothetical data set. Now, a lot of uh, some, we've gotten emails that say, like, oh, is this an actual data set? Like, can I generalize my findings? No, you cannot. OK, so this is a hypothetical data set that we made up. OK, so don't generalize any of these findings to anything, just FYI. 
Okay, so the first thing we want to do is get some descriptors. Remember, I talked about descriptors before. What are descriptors? Descriptors are basically like, oh, what's the mean? What's the uh, minimum? What's the maximum? So this is not a statistical class, but um, I believe some of you have familiarity with what an average is. Okay, I think most of you do. So what I'm going to do, I'm on slide 21 right now. Okay, I'm going to analyze. I'm going to go to descriptives. So one, two, three down in this one. And then uh, descriptives again. OK. Now, if you get lost, you can follow along with the uh, slide in 21. Now, I'm going to show you some tricks, OK? So uh, the first trick I'm going to show you is to right click on the left box and just say display variable names. I like doing that because I don't want all this like stuff after it. So it's just the variable names. The other thing you can do is right click again and say sort alphabetically. So that's going to help you in finding the, your, your variables, especially if um, your variable, you have a lot of variables, which I see very often. OK, so what I want is I want to analyze gender. So I'm going to drag it over by clicking on the right arrow. I'm going to highlight uh, reading. I'm going to use control to highlight uh, writing, right? I'm going to use control to highlight math and then science. So those are the variables I want. And then I'm going to click, click OK. Now, if you see that, this is now the what? The output viewer, right? Remember? Talked about the output viewer. OK, so we basically got the mean, the minimum, and maximum and standard deviation. Remember in the, um, the command syntax PDF file, these were the defaults, right? That's why these are the defaults that you see. You can request more than this. Now let's take a look. OK, so oh, the math score, what's the average? 52 points, 0.64. What's the minimum? 33. What's the maximum? 75. Now what do you notice about science? Okay. Uh, you feel free to put it in the chat. What do you notice about the science? Yes, smaller n, right? So there's missing data. Yes, exactly. Small, less n, perfect. So there's missing data in the science score. Remember that. And um, if you go back to it, you'll notice it's system missing. Now, um, what does valid and listwise mean? Valid and listwise means, let's say we took all those variables, okay? We're only going to include the people that have data on all the variables, gender, math, reading, writing, and science. That means we only have 195, right? Because we're, we're constrained by science. So is that something to think about when you run any type of analysis is how much missing data do you have? If you have one variable that has 90% missing, if you do list-wise, you're going to delete 90% of your data. So you want to include variables that have the minimum amount of missing, and you want to include the minimum amount of variables in your set. The more variables you include, the more likely you'll have missing data. Now let's look at gender. So gender is a variable that ranges between 0 and 1. What does that mean when we take the mean of that variable? Any thoughts? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute. There's a no. question too you when you're done. Sorry. Yeah, I see. I actually see that. Okay, so basically the means are not are, are for each individual. Okay. So so um, but it says valid list wise means if you ran another type of analysis, it's going to use the 195. So does anyone have an idea of what a mean means for um, gender? Yeah. 
So if one is uh, male, it means that there are more male students? Yes, yes, exactly. So if one is male and you take the mean, then you get 0.545. That means 54% of your sample is male. Okay, so very good. Now, how many percent are female? If, if it's only male, female, we're assuming um, dichotomy in the gender, then you would get 100 minus 54.5. So it would be 45.5. So 45.5% would be female, okay? So that's what a mean represents for uh, what we call a dichotomous or binary variable. So you can still get the mean, but you just have to know what that represents. Um, and standard deviation is kind of like a measure of the variability. Okay, so any questions on that? All right, so I think we're progressing pretty well. Oops, keep shrinking that. All right, so now let's say we wanna um, see if socioeconomic status kind of impacts uh, the scores. We're not running any kind of t-test or anything, okay? So we're just getting descriptives. So what if we want to see, oh, does low SES mean the scores are lower or higher? Let's see. Okay, so we're going to go to data. We're going to split the file. All right. And I'm on, page, I'm on slide 22 right now. I'm going to split the file. Okay. And what I want to do is I want to compare groups. And then I want to find the SES variable. So groups based on SES. Okay. What does that do? That basically runs my descriptives by SES. So if SES has three categories, low, medium, and high, it's going to run those means and standard deviations and min and max for, me, for SES low, medium, and high. We're going to get three sets of output. We click OK. Now, this does not run the analysis, right? So, oh, you're looking at the output window. Why isn't it doing what I'm doing or what I'm asking it to do? Well, let's first take a look at the lower right corner. So I, I, uh, if you see my mouse, I'm hovering around the lower right corner, and it says split by SES. That's how you know your file is being split. Then I'm going to show you a little trick. I'm going to recall the dialog that I just ran by clicking this down arrow button. See, and now it recalls all the analysis that I've done previously, in particular descriptives. See, it retains in memory all the variables that I already requested. And now I'm going to click OK. And actually, before I do that, I'm going to show you paste. Paste, remember the syntax editor? So instead of clicking on um, OK, I'm going to click paste. And now it gives me the syntax, right? Descriptives. Sorry. There is a um, fire in Orange County, and I live close to the fire. So uh, you might hear some uh, noises from my phone. Let me pause that real quick. All right. Nothing to worry about for now. Now, if something happens to me, Andy's going to take over, OK? All right. so. This is the syntax, all right? So I'm going to click play. And that's the same thing as clicking OK. So I'm going to show you that again. Data, split file, organize, compare groups, SES. Now, in this time, I'm going to click OK instead of paste. I just wanted you to show, show you the paste syntax. All right. And look at what we have here. All right, so you notice the sample sizes are smaller, right? Because we are stratifying the analysis. They're still missing data um, of science because they're smaller than the others. What else do you notice about the mean of writing? Let's say stratified. Well, basically, if you see, let's look at the mean of writing, 50.6, right? Uh, and then we see for low. 
Now let's look at middle, writing, 51.92. Let's look at high, writing, 55.91. So it looks like there is some kind of relationship between SCS and writing, right? So the higher the SCS or social economic status, the higher the writing score. So just FYI, this is completely hypothetical data, but in general, that is uh, a common phenomenon is that we see uh, SCS as a highly predictive uh, test score. Now, I think I heard someone um, say, what is the difference by organized output by groups? That is exactly the exercise we're gonna go over. Okay, so let's go to exercise two on page 24 on the slides. So try running the same analysis, but select organized output by groups. Which do you prefer? Okay, so I'll give you like two minutes to kind of start on that. It shouldn't be too hard now that you know how to do split file. Okay, so yes, the output table will be separate. Yes, exactly. Okay, so let's try it. So split file. Now instead of compare groups, we're gonna go output, organize output by groups. Oh, why isn't it running? Why why is my descriptor still the same? Because I haven't run the descriptors yet, right? I only split the file. So I'm going to recall, and now I've run the descriptors again. All right, look at look at the output. It's a little different now, right? So now it splits it by SES low, and then has another set of output for SES middle, and another output from SES high. When would you use one or the other? Honestly, I have no preference. I I tend to prefer compare pro groups because it's all on one table. This is useful if you want to in export it into. Uh, word and then you want to create like separate tables so you, and I'll show you how easy this is to copy into uh, Excel uh, I'm gonna open Excel so I just right clicked on that table and click copy and now I'm going to click control V and now it pasted it into Excel this is how easy SPS is in terms of transferring from one to another and again I click right click copy open Excel, paste or control V. And there you have it. You can um, format this however you want in Excel. You can export this into Word if you want. So I find that pretty helpful for Excel users. All right, any questions on that? Yeah, like uh, most of us don't use Macs in this um, lab, so we, are, we can't help you too much with the, the Mac stuff, but a lot of this is very similar across programs. Okay, so now, what do we have to do when we wanna just analyze everything again without stratifying? So you notice, I do that, so this a lot. It's like- I, uh, Honey, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Somebody asked, can you show how to run the descriptors, please? Oh yeah. So um, I go to analyze descriptives and descriptives again. Okay. Now, um, how do you go back? So this, I, I do this a lot. Like I, I run a split file and then I, I run another analysis where I don't want the split file. Like, oh, why am I getting all this like crazy output? You gotta turn split file off. Okay, so you notice in the lower right corner, it says split by SES. We don't want that for the remaining exercises. So we're going to go to data. We're going to split file again, but we're gonna click analyze all cases. Do not create groups. Then I'm gonna click okay. 
I am on page 25 right now of the slides. And now look at the data view and the lower right corner, and you will see that split by SES is now gone. That's how you know you've done it correctly. Any questions about that? Yes. OK, so um, are we ready to move on? So now let's say I'm on page uh, 26 now. Now let's say uh, you want to see a passing score uh, on, the re uh, on the reading is greater than or equal to 60, OK? So you want to see how many people passed, OK? So what we're going to do is call the conditional select. So we're going to go to data. And right under the file, you're going to see select cases. Right now, we're selecting all cases. But a conditional select means we're going to select if, OK? So I'm clicking on the if condition is satisfied. And then I click on the if dot, dot, dot. And I'm on page um, 26, if you want to follow along. Now I can just drag the reading score over. I'm going to click uh, Display Variable Names, right click. I'm going to drag the read over. Now I want the read to be greater than or equal to 60, right? So I click this and 60. Now you can also type it yourself, OK? You don't have to use the buttons. That's just to help you. OK, then click Continue. Am I going too fast? Is this OK? Now you'll see if condition is satisfied if read is greater than or equal to 60. Click OK. Now let's run our descriptives again. What do you expect? Oh, first of all, let's see, see how it crossed out. What did it cross out? So let's look at one of them. So in ID 70 or uh, observation one, we see that read 57 is crossed out. That makes sense, right? Because we want to cross, we want to select only people who are greater than or equal to 60. So let's look at observation 11 or uh, ID 81, right? Read is 63, that makes sense, right? So we, we know that we've done this correctly. Now let's, let's look at the descriptives again. Recall dialogue, descriptives. Let's look at the descriptives. Look at the min. Look at the min for reading. 60, right? That's exactly what we wanted. Any questions on conditional selection? OK, so let's undo that conditional selection because we don't want that to carry through. So I'm going to data, select cases, and all cases. So now you notice those crosses are gone. That means we selected all of them, right? So let's go to variable view one more time. And let's look at the type column. You see there's one column, uh, one variable with a string, right? Typically, you don't want string, but we're going to show you how to select a string variable conditionally. So let's say we only want to pick people. You see these program types? There's vocational, general, and academic. Let's select only the people who are in academic. So I'm going to data, select cases, if the same dialogue we did before. So I'm not going to go over to, to, to again. Now, instead of uh, read, we're going to go program type. Now, remember a string, OK? You have to enclose the values of that string by um, quotes. OK, so I'm going to do a double quote, academic, and then close it off with double quotes. It has to be spelled exactly the same way. I don't think it'll work if you, if you just did academic with a capital. OK, and then click Continue. Let's see if it worked. There we go. So you see, we crossed out people who are vocational. And then we selected people who are academic. Any questions about that?
Okay, so I'm not going to go over the conditional select range. I, I don't find that very useful for myself. Um, but let's go to let's go to page 29. Okay. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to um, select all cases again. Okay. We don't want we don't want just the academic. Okay. Then let's go to uh, analyze. Let's say we want to compare the means. Okay. By program type. So let's let's see let's see what that does. So we're going to analyze. We're going to go to compare means. And then we're going to go to means. So this is page twenty nine. This is page 29. Now my dependent list, okay? I want reading. I want writing. I want math. And I want science. Now the independent list, I want program type. This is on page 29 of the slides. And let's click OK. All right, so what did it do? Well, it basically did kind of like what we did before, right? With the split file. It gave us basically the, the, the reading, writing, math, and science score by program type. So that's another way to do this, okay? And you can check if you do it the same way uh, with SCS that so you get the same thing. It gives you the mean, standard deviation, and sample size. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay. So we went over some kind of basic descriptives of the mean and standard deviation and how to conditionally select. I like pictures. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to create something called a box plot in SPSS. So a box plot is just a way to visualize what we call the distribution of the data, okay? So first I'll show you how to do it. We're going to graphs, legacy dialogues. Let's say we want a uh, box plot right here. This is on page 30 of the slides. I'm going to click on simple and define. Now, it's going to ask you what variable you want the box plot to be. I want the variable to be right, the writing score. Now it's going to ask you if you want uh, what the category axis is. This is basically um, on the X variable or on the x-axis, what you want to split the box plot by. Let's say for now I want to split it by gender. I want to see if the writing score differs by gender visually. So I'm going to click OK. And this is the box plot of 0 and 1. So one flaw of this I can see already, and I'm on page uh, 31, is that there's no um, label, right? So how do I know what gender zero is, what is gender one? Well, let's say we know that uh, male equals zero and then female equals one, okay? So I'm gonna go to the PowerPoint so I can kind of uh, write on this. So this, I'm going to be on page 31. Okay. So we know that um, zero is male and one, oops, and one is female, okay? Uh, let me share the first. Okay. Now, the thing to care about most is this bar here, this this horizontal black bar. That's what we call the median, okay? Um, so we're not gonna go de detail what that means, but basically it means kind of halfway. 50% of people have a score lower and 50% of people have a score higher than this value. In this case, it's around 52 or something, right? Let's say. 
then the lower bar represents the 25th percentile, which means 25% are below for this value. It's around maybe 41 or something. And then 75th percentile means about, or 75% of people are below this value. So this is like maybe 59. So what this um, bar plot tells you is kind of the median, the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. Now these, these little things here are the lower fence and the upper fence. I won't go into detail what they are, but anything beyond that fence, like let's say this person is 20, that's gonna be what we call an outlier. Let's say this person is 80, that person's gonna be an outlier in the opposite direction. So what do you notice uh, if you compare males and females? Well, it looks like the median of females is higher, right? And maybe, you know, there's a larger range of lower values. Okay, so this is a good way to kind of visualize the distribution of the data. Any questions about box plot and how to use it? How to implement it? Oops, where is the Okay. Uh, I want to. Okay. All right. So another way of visualizing data is called the histogram. So what we've been what we've been doing now up to now is called univariate. Okay. So these what I mean by univariate is we want to do one variable at a time. So what's the variable that we're doing? It's called writing, the writing score. So we've been doing that one writing score at a time. Um, I'll talk about what we call bivariate analysis a little later, okay? So the box plot was a univariate analysis, descriptive analysis, and the histogram is also a univariate descriptive analysis. A histogram basically gives you a, a description of the distribution as well, but uh, kind of more in terms of a line graph, so or, or a bar graph. So I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. So what we're gonna do is go back to SPSS. Now we're going to get the histogram for writing, the writing score. So you go to graphs, you go to legacy dialogues, and then you go to histogram right here. What's the variable we want? Writing. Okay. Now I'm gonna check this thing called display normal curve. Um, and we'll see what that is, okay? So this is um, what we get in the output viewer. This is on page 33 as well. So you'll notice the mean is 52, the standard deviation is 9.4, and the N is 200. This is basically what we got before, right? With the descriptives, it's just visually now, what do we see? Now, what do you think that, bla that black curve represents? Remember we check, check something there. And why why do they why did they care about overlaying this onto this histogram? Anyone have any ideas? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Sample versus Yes, normal distribution curve. That's very good. Okay, so the black bar is basically uh, what we call a normal distribution. Okay, so it's what it would ideally represent. So these um, ideally, you want it to look like a bell shape, right? So a lot of um, assumptions of statistics requires that your data be normally distributed. Okay, so we're not going to go over exactly what that means, but it should look like a bell. Now you see in this uh, data set, you know, maybe it's not exactly normal, okay? So you see a lot of people in the upper ranges, uh, the writing score. So what do you do with that? We're not gonna go over that in this class, but um, this is just a way to see if your data is normally distributed. Ideally, it should kind of look like that bell-shaped curve, okay? Um, sample versus population is kind of interesting. It is kind of a comparing sample. Let's say your population was normally distributed. Yes, you want to compare your sample to that population. So that's a good observation as well. 
Okay, now writing is a what type of score in terms of measure? It's a scale, right? Let's check that to make sure. Writing is a scale variable. Now, what about for um, something like SES, right? So do descriptives work for SES? Well, we don't want, want to treat descriptive statistics like the mean of SES because one, two, and three don't really mean anything. So you don't want to take the mean of one, two, and three, right? So if you have something like a nominal variable, typically you want to analyze it as a frequency. So let's go to analyze. I'm on page um, 34 right now. Now again, we're doing descriptive statistics. And instead of descriptive, we're going to click frequencies. What variable do we want? SCS. Now I'm going to check his, uh, I'm going to check charts right here. And I'm going to check histogram and show normal curve on histogram. This is on page 34, if, you, uh, if this time going a little too fast. And I'm going to click OK. OK, so what did we just do? We got the frequency table, OK? Not of like writing score, right? This isn't like, oh, split by SES. No, this is the actual number of people in our sample, in our school, that had low SES, middle SES, and high SES. So looking at the histogram, you can kind of see that most people are in the uh, two, right? Now, would it make sense to overlay this normal distribution for something like gender? How about something like ethnicity? Now, if you think about it, like those are categorical variables, right? So would you expect a normal distribution of ethnicity? Um, for me, I don't think so. So in general, you don't really want to overlay a normal distribution on categorical variables. This is an exception because SES is kind of what we call an ordinal variable. So it has properties of a scale variable. So you can kind of see that it's normally distributed. But in general, you don't want to run, compare that to a normal curve, especially if it's a nominal variable. Any questions about that? Okay, now we're going to exercise three on page 36. So it says create a histogram of writing scores from females and males. Hint panel by columns and then map it to the bar plot. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to work on that. And then I'll show you how to do it. Oh, maybe I should actually display the uh, exercise for you. But it is on page uh, 36. Okay, so I'm going to show you now. Basically, we're going to the histogram again, right? We're getting writing score. And then we want um, to panel it, right? So let's say we want to panel it by gender. We're going to, hint says panel by columns. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, you see that? 
So basically what we got then is two histograms, right? One for zero, one for one. Number zero is male and one is female. So what does that do for us? Um, well, we can see that the male one doesn't really look normal to me. Uh, we can see that females in general have more higher scores accumulated on the right. And then uh, let's compare it to the box plot. Okay, so basically we're seeing that there's that female and male, uh, that females have higher scores on average, right? If you see the 50th percentile, the median, it is higher than males, right? Now you also see that the range of scores is higher for males, right? So there's lower lows and then there's slightly higher highs. Okay, so lowest score is maybe 31 for um, males and the lowest score is maybe 33 or four for females. So that's just a good way to kind of um, compare the histogram to the bar plot. You know, it's good to, these are basically representing similar things, okay? Johnny, yeah, there's, go ahead. Two, there are two requests to do it again. Sorry, say again? Um, there are two requests to make the graph again. Could you do it? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. More time? yeah. Okay, so what I did, uh, so I, I shouldn't have used recall dialog because that's a little confusing. So I'm gonna use graph, I'm going to legacy dialog, and then I'm going to histogram. Then let's reset. Okay, so what I want is the writing score, display normal curve, and then I want to panel by columns, gender. And that should give me the same thing. So it's good to kind of, um, you know, plot both just to kind of see, you know, it, it should be kind of corresponding to the similar things. Obviously it's easier to see if you have a normal distribution with the histogram, right? It's hard to see if you have a normal distribution with the bar graph or with the box plot. Okay, so any questions on that before we move on? I think uh, we're gonna skip over the next couple of slides. So I gave you a challenge exercise, but you can do that on your own. All right, so we talked about univariate um, descriptive, right? Um, what's a bivariate? Well, bi means two, right? bicycle, two wheels. So when you see bivariate, you mean you usually talk about two variables at a time. All right, so um, so for example, for SES and prog program type, those are our, our two S, uh, categorical variables, right? Let's say we kind of want to see the relationship of those two categorical variables. So how do we do that? Well, that's called a cross tabulation. Okay, so cross tabulation. So I'm on page 41 right now of the slides. So what I'm gonna do is we're still running descriptive statistics. So I'm gonna to analyze descriptive statistics. And SPSS just shortens that to cross tabs, cross tabulation. Now it doesn't really matter, you know, whether you put it on the rows or the columns, it's really up to you. I'm gonna put program type on the rows and I'm gonna put SCS on the columns. Now the, the slide asks you, what kind of variable is prog type? There's two things going on there. Anyone have any ideas? Remember, or if you remember? Well, let me see if I can. Okay, well, if you don't remember, the A means that this is a string variable, right? Okay, but what's the other more, more important thing? The more important thing, yes, someone says string variable. The more important thing is that these are nominal variables. Okay, so remember cross tabs are usually for nominal variables. And what kind of relationship is it? A bivariate relationship. 
what we did was univariate when we ran, remember when we ran SCS um, and we counted how many? That's a univariate analysis. For bivariate analysis, you usually have something on the rows and you have something on the columns because you have two variables, okay? We just click OK. Now, uh, this is basically the cross tabulation of program type and SES. Let's see if we notice any patterns. Well, anyone have an idea about kind of what the patterns you're seeing? Well, let's see. Um, oh, no? Okay. I see a very few people in the vocational program on the high SES, right? So that's one observation. Um, I only see seven of those. And then I see a lot of people in the academic program in the high SES. Um, I see more people in the vocational program than the middle and the low. So what I suspect is that maybe um, SCS is somehow related to the program type. Now we're, we're not running any statistical analyses yet. So this is just a hypothesis, okay? So it just means that maybe there is a possible relationship that uh, high SES and academic program are kind of related. Okay, so, but we're not gonna go over the statistics to test that. That's for another class. Now, uh, we just talked about two nominal variables, right? We talked about two nominal variables. What about if we have two scale variables? What kind of analysis do you think, bivariate analysis do you think we can run for two scale variables? Anyone have any idea? All right, so for two, yes, correlation, yes, perfect. So uh, yeah, so if you talk about you know correlation, right? So what's the correlation of weight and height? You expect a positive correlation? I think so. Um, taller people are just generally way more. Um, so in general, uh, a bivariate relationship involving two scale variables is called a correlation, okay? And how do we do that in SPSS? We're going to analyze. Now there is a correlate menu option. And look at that, we have bivariate. So we know this is a bivariate relationship, right? Two variables. Again, I like, I like kind of just seeing the variable names, right click, variable names, right click, sort alphabetically. What do I want to uh, see the correlation table of? I want read, I want write, I want math and I want science. You notice the ruler? So these are all uh, scale variables. And just make sure you have the Pearson correlation coefficient checked. And then let's run it. Okay, so I'm not gonna cover too much in detail, but the closer you are to one on the positive side, the higher your correlation, okay? Um, so here we all have positive correlation. So we're looking at things that are highly correlated, right? The double star just means, oh, it's significantly correlated. We're not gonna go over exactly what that means, but uh, you see pretty high correlations. Now, um, what do you notice about the sample size? The N, 195%. Yes, that's exactly what we found before, right? Now, um, let's 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 check some options there when we run the correlate. Okay, so let's go back to analyze. We're going to correlate again by variate. Now, let's go to options. Okay, so what we just did was called pairwise correlation. What does that mean? That means basically you're taking two variables at a time. What happens if we click missing values and we click exclude cases list wise? Okay, so let me do that again. Options, missing values, exclude cases list wise. Let's click okay again. What do you notice now about the sample size?
Right. So you, s but what is the sample size? They are missing, right? Let's look at the little annotation below. The B, you see that? B dot this wise. The sample size is 195. Yes, exactly. All 195, right? Why do you think that's happening? Well, like I said, if you do list wise deletion for any variables that have missing data, that person's data is going to be deleted. Why does that matter? Um, well, there's some statistical assumptions that say a correlation is not really valid if you use pairwise correlations, okay? Because you're only looking at the people who, who you have a different sample size for every correlation. And that's not ideal because um, for a usually when you want to look at the correlation as a whole, you want everyone to have the same sample size. So just know that in general, you want list-wise deletion when you look at correlations as a whole. Now, if you only care about the bivariate relationship of reading and writing, let's say, that's okay. But if you want to look at the correlation table as a whole, generally, generally it's better to look at list-wise deletion, especially if you want to do more advanced analyses with these correlations. For example, there's something I'm not going to talk about in this seminar called um, factor analysis, where that does actually matter. Okay. So just be careful about what you use. Uh, you want to you generally stick with list-wise deletion, but if you just want to run descriptives on each of the pairs, pairwise deletion is okay. Any questions about correlation? Okay, so I'm going to go through a quick poll. Um, you don't have to know the answer to these polls, but I'm going to, th that's why it's called a poll, um, because I didn't cover it. But this is just kind of, maybe a kind of try to guess at what the answer is. I did talk about one of them. So number one, the so significant correlation implies you have a high correlation. Number two, list-wise deletion deletes all the missing data before running analysis. Number three, assume all variables have missing data. The more variables you put into the bivariate correlation, the smaller your sample size after list-wise deletion. So I did talk about actually two of them already. I did talk about two and three already, actually. The only one I didn't really talk about is one, but you can kind of impl imply that. And then I'll show the results in a couple of seconds. So it looks like maybe half of you have responded. Um, I'll give you guys maybe 20 more seconds. Okay, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, so it looks like most of you said a significant correlation implies you have a high correlation. That's false. That's That's false, right? Because you can have a significant correlation be very small. All that correlation tests is that it's different from zero. Okay, we didn't talk about that at all. But just know that um, you can have a significant, those stars you see on the graph, on the, on the, on the bivariate correlation table, it doesn't mean it's, it's high. You can have a 0 0.01 be significant because it's different from zero. Uh, number two, list-wise deletion deletes all missing data. Good, you guys got that. So basically, that's what it does compared to pairwise uh, correlation, right? It deletes all the missing data before running analysis. And then assume you have more of all the variables have missing data. The more variables you put into your correlation, the smaller sample size you will get, right? Because by chance, it's not everyone's going to have the same exact missing data. So you're going to delete a lot of people if all their missing patterns are different. So that's very good. Okay, so you want to be careful when you put in something uh, into your analysis to look at the missing data, right? Uh, before you put it in. You don't want your sample size to go down to like 10, right? Okay, so I think you guys get it. That's very good. So now let's move on. Uh, now, instead of uh, looking just at the numbers, I'm going back to PowerPoint uh, page. I'm going to go to page. We already went through that. Page 46. Okay, so remember we talked about the histogram and then we talked about the box plot, right? So those are all univariate kind of uh, depictions of our, our descriptives. Those are a way to visualize univariate descriptives. Now, how do you visualize a bivariate descriptives? 
what do you think that would look like? Uh, do you guys have any idea of what a bivariate graph looks like? I'm sure you've done this maybe in um, high school or college. So when you look at a bivariate relationship, right, usually you have two variables. Like let's say you call it an X and a Y. So you should have an X axis and then you should have a Y axis, right? That's a bivariate relationship. Okay, so um, let's see what that looks like. So we're gonna go back to SCSS. So I'm on page 46. You go to graphs, you go to legacy dialogues, you go to scatter dot. That's a scatter plot. I'm gonna click on simple scatter and then define. This is on page 46 if you're having trouble following along. Remember I talked about the X axis and the Y axis. The X axis is the horizontal axis, the horizontal line. The Y axis is the vertical line. So I wanna receive the relationship of reading and writing scores. I'm gonna go reading on the X axis and the writing on the Y axis. And look at that. X axis, reading, Y axis, writing. What do you notice about this relationship? Positive, right? So what does positive mean? It means the higher your reading score, the higher your writing score. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it looks like it is. Like people who get 70 on reading, they're getting about 60 on writing. People who get 30 on reading are getting about 37 on writing, right? So a negative relationship would look the kind of the opposite, right? It would kind of go sloping down from left to right, okay? So that's a negative relationship. We didn't see any negative relationships, remember, on bivariate. Now, if you go back to the correlation, right? If you go back to the correlation, uh, we have reading and writing, right? 0.5967, right? That is the exact depiction of what we have in the scatter plot, right? So we are basically describing visually what that correlation looks like with the scatter plot. So that is a correlation of 0.597. That's exactly what we just depicted. Some people find it more easy to describe something visually. Okay, so we're gonna go through the exercise on page 48. Um, create a scatter plot of write on the X axis and read on the Y axis. Okay, so all I'm asking you to do is to flip the X and the Y axis. And I'll give you like two minutes to work on that. Okay, so you should have gotten around here. Uh, let me know if you need more time, but um, basically I'm putting right on the X axis and read on the Y axis. Okay, what do you see here? Now, um, is this still a positive relationship? I think so. Now, how does that compare to the other thing we just did? Well, is the relationship still positive? I think so. Now let's track one ID. So if you go to your data set, you can find this ID, 133, that has a reading score of 50 and a writing score of 31. So you see the green dot on the right one? This is exactly, uh, the X is, oops. Let me just, so this is for X equals 50, Y equals 31, right? X equals 50, Y equals 31. So that's this dot here. Now, what does it mean to flip the axis? It just means X equals 31 and Y equals 50, 
right? X equals 31 and Y equals 50. Did we do really anything different? I mean, by flipping the axis, does that change the relationship? Does that mean that as one goes down, the other goes down? Well, I mean, as one goes up, the other goes down now. No, the relationship stays positive, right? So if you match the correlation table, you'll, you'll get the exact same value, 0 0.579 or 597. I don't remember actually what it was. I think it was 579, but it's exactly the same number, okay? So ch changing the order of the X and Y from the x-axis to the y-axis doesn't change the correlation. It's still it's still the exact same correlation. And if you if you sh if run the analysis, you can prove to yourself that that's true. Now we just saw a bivariate relationship, right? A correlation table, though, is a bunch of bivariate relationships in one, right? So when we saw the reading, writing, math, and science, that was all in one table. How do we visualize that? Well, we can create what we call a matrix scatter plot. Matrix just means you have like a lot of columns and a lot of rows. Okay. We're going to show you how to do that in SPSS. So now I'm on page 50. I'm going again to graphs and I'm going to legacy dialogues. Then I'm going to Scatter dot again, because same exact thing, except now what do I do? I click on matrix scatter. Page 50, if you want to follow along. What are our matrix variables? We want math. We want read, reading. We want science. And we want writing. Okay, just those four variables, click OK. Look at that, so we have a matrix scatter plot. What does this really represent? So let's go back to the slides um, and I'll make this an exercise. Okay, match the matrix, matrix plot to the scatter plots we made before and compare it to the correlation table. What other analysis represents this matrix? Uh, this one's not really like an exercise you go through like with SPSS, but just like draw like, like maybe like draw like which one it is, you know? Oops. Like which one is it? And then link it to the um, correlation table. I mean, not correlation, oops, I already told you the answer. Uh, link it to the scatter plot. Okay, so if you see the, um, the x-axis on the matrix and the y-axis on the matrix, it'll tell you which variable you're looking at. So let's look at um, this one first. This is the reading score on the x-axis, and this is the writing score on the y-axis. So what do we want? We want the reading score on the x-axis and the writing score on the way. Right? Okay. Did I flip them in the slides? I might have flipped them in the slides. You, you correct me if I flip them in the slides, okay? Um, so I'm going to match this to this one. Is that what you got? Tell me if you got something wrong, okay? Or different. I think the slides are flipped. Okay. And then I want the writing score for, so that's that one. And then the, let's call this the square. So the writing score on the X axis. Oh, you know why? Because um, it's symmetric too. Okay. So the writing score on the X axis and the reading score on the Y axis. So that's this one. And I'm actually, did you guys get the same thing? Oh, good. You got the same thing. Perfect. All right. So the slides might be incorrect, the solution. Okay. So what other analysis represents this matrix? So basically what we did was we, 
we we created more than one scatter plot, right? And we just made it into one big matrix. That's all we did. What exactly is that analysis that we just ran? I mean, what is the statistical representation of this matrix scatter plot? We already ran it before, remember? It's the correlation matrix. Good job. Good good job, Gilbert. Okay, yes. It's the it's the representation visually of the correlation matrix. Okay. So that's very good. So you can literally map the same correlations to um, the matrix scatter plot. All right, and I'll let you work on that. But basically, you get the same correlation, right? So that's what I mean by it's symmetric. So the correlation of reading and writing is the same as the correlation of writing and reading. Any questions about that? Uh, let me see if, uh... oh, Andy, are you still here? I don't think he's here anymore. Uh, let's see, Christine is no. here. Oh, Christine will, yeah, okay. So Christine will be uh, answering your chat questions. Okay, so um, anyone else have questions about what we just did? Okay, can you tell me if you need a break? Happy to continue, okay. Anyone else? No break, okay. Continue, okay, perfect, all right. Very good. All right, so we're gonna go to the next section, okay. So what we just talked about was basically how to describe your data, right? Um, but what about like, if you have variables that come to you and it's not the way you want it to be? That's why we wanna modify the data. Okay, so we're gonna talk about like reordering the data, renaming the, the variables, um, converting string to numeric, things like that, okay? All right, so the first thing I want you to do is open up HS0 again, but close out all the other windows. So we have a lot of things open probably. So I'm just gonna close it all out and open HS0 again. Okay, let me make sure I'm sharing everything. Okay. All right, so we're gonna open HS0 again, okay? Now, remember the uh, variables are going to be in the variable view, right? This tells you the order of the variables. What if we don't like the order of the variables? Because this is, this is maybe someone else collected the data and then you, you wanna see basically the order of the variables changed. You don't like the order that they give you. Like, I like having the ID as the first variable. So how do we do that in SPSS? Well, we're going to variable view. You see ID is the second order of the variable. We're gonna hold on to that with the left click of the mouse. And then we're gonna drag, you see that uh, box, rectangular box that comes up? We're gonna hold the mouse button, drag it up, and then let it go. You see how I did that? Now ID is the first variable. That's all you gotta do, okay? So that's how you reorder variables in SPSS. Now, if you look at the data view, you'll see that the ID is now the first column. So remember variable view tra um, changes from the observation being the variable to the columns in the data view being the variable. So if you change the row in the variable view, you're gonna change the column in the data view. Not too bad, right? Um, let's, okay, so for some variables, remember the unique thing about SPSS is that it gives you value and variable labels. So there's two things going on. There's the variable label, okay? That's the first thing we're gonna do. 
So we go to variable view. We want to label the, the, the school type variable. This is called the variable label. And then we're going to call it the type, oops, the type of school the student attended. Okay, so it's going to be the, the variable label. Now there's something else called the value label. Okay, on this column, oops, sorry, right here, the value label. What kind of variables would we need value labels for? You guys can kind of, would we need value labels for nominal or scale variables? Think about that and maybe you can put in the chat or whatever you want. You can unmute yourself too. Would we need value labels for nominal or for scale? Uh, okay, 50-50. No, nominal. A lot of people say nominal. Perfect. Yes. So we would need value labels for nominal, right? Because if we remember the um, gender, we have zero and one. How do we know what's male and female? But for like reading, do we need to know what the value of 52 versus 53 is? We know what 52 and versus 53 is for reading. It's a score. So in general, we don't need a value label for a scale variable. We need a value label for a nominal variable. So you see school type is nominal, right? So according to the slide, we are going to uh, put a value of one. So for public, we're gonna add, and for two, it's going to be private. So it just means public and versus private school. So numeric value of one is now public school. A numeric value of two is now private school. I'm going to click OK. And now you have a value label. OK. Um, quick poll. You don't have to know the answer. The value label maps the numeric code to a, numeric code to a character, true or false. That is on page 57 if you want to look at that poll again. You could just type it in the chat. The value label maps the numeric code to a character. It's kind of a, a trick question. True or false? And I'll say again, the value label maps the numeric code to a character. And you have no idea, just let me know. <laughs> True? Anyone else? True? Okay, so kind of, it is kind of true, but I told you it's kind of a trick question. Okay, so let me explain what I mean. So I remember a character, right, is like, is like this, program type, like string, right? So what the value label does, yes, it maps it to a label, but it doesn't map it to a character. It doesn't change the underlying property of the school type, okay? So the underlying property is still numeric. It just adds a label to that numeric value, okay? So by changing the value, it doesn't change the type. So remember, it doesn't change it from a numeric to a string. OK, is that clear? So this is still going to be a numeric variable. Now, what if you wanted to actually change from a string to a numeric variable? Remember, we don't really like string variables. OK, so the only string variable we have is program type. OK. so. How do we change that to a numeric variable? Well, let's go to data view. I'm on page uh, 58 right now. I'm going to transform. I'm going to automatic recode. 
What do we want to change from a string to a numeric? We want to change program type. Now, you, do you see all those question marks? Basically, it means it, it, RESPSS wants a name. So what's the name we want? PROG. Let's just call it PROG for pro program. And I click Add New Name. So on the slides, remember uh, what we said about the missing data? Maybe this would be interesting. I'm not going to click it here. But it says treat blank string values as user missing. That might actually be useful because remember it treated that dot as non-missing. So if we maybe try clicking on that in your own and see what that does. Okay, so what did we do? What did we just do? We used the automatic recode, which basically converts a string variable to a numeric one. Let's see if that happens. And remember, program is like academic, general, and vocational. And now it just recodes it to one, two, and three. And it added a value label. Let's look at it. Yeah, you see that? So what type of variable is this? Numeric. Oh, look at that. It basically converted it from a string to a numeric and, and transferred it to a value label. All right. So what's the benefit of doing that? Is that now this is no longer a character variable. This is now a numeric variable, which can be used in a lot of analyses. And then you can have, for example, user missing. You can also um, add these values, whereas you couldn't add values before. Any questions about converting? Now, the final thing we want to do is just we want to always label the variable the type of program in which I'm on page um, 59 right now. Student was enrolled. So it's just the type of program. It's the same thing as prog type with the string, except now it's a numeric variable. Any questions about that? Okay, not too bad, right? In general, do we want our variables to numeric to be numeric or string? Well, I, I think it's better to leave everything as numeric if you can, and then only for the, the variables that are truly string variables. Like let's say it's something like a survey where they're asked to fill out things like, oh, uh, I think this seminar is awesome. You don't want to convert that to a, a numeric variable, right? So you want to leave that as a string. Otherwise, if you have some kind of variable that you want to put in your study or your analysis, you want to keep it as a numeric and just recode it. Okay. All right, so let's go to page 60. Renaming variables is very easy in SPSS. Let's say um, instead of gender, we want to rename it to female. All you got to do is go to variable view, you double click on the name, and then you change the name. Why would it be better to rename this female? And right now female, this is one versus zero. Why is it better to rename this female versus gender? Any ideas? Okay, no ideas? All right. So. You typically want to rename something that's self-descriptive. What I mean by that is you look at the variable, you know what it is. Female means that one is female and zero is male, okay? If we just did gender, we don't know if one is female or zero is male, or is, oh, if one is female or zero, uh, one is male. But by coding it female, usually you want the ones to be what you indicate. Right? It's called an indicator variable or a dummy variable. Then that one is now female. Does that make sense? Instead of gender, why that would be more useful? OK, good. So in general, for categorical or binary variables, you want the one to be labeled the same thing as your variable name. So like, let's say it's like, um, uh, let's say you're doing ethnicity. 
like uh, Asian versus not. Okay, so you want Asian. You want the variable to be called Asian, and then one is Asian, and then zero is not Asian. It's generally true. Okay, so um, let's look at the race variable. Okay, right here. So let's say this represents ethnicity like um, African American, Asian, white, Latino, Hispanic. But let's say five means unknown. Okay, so we want to code that to system missing. Remember system missing? System missing is represented by dot. This is called recoding variables. So I am on page 61 of the slides. So re-transform is what you would do instead of data. We've been working with data a lot. And then I want to recode into same variable. Now, be careful with doing recode into same variables because um, sometimes you, you, you are going to delete that variable, the old variable by doing that. So if you want to, you can recode into different variables. We're gonna show you recode into the same variables. And then we're gonna do race. Now we're gonna click on old and new values. So what I wanna do is convert five to system missing. So the old value is on the left and the new value is on the right. The old value is five. The new value is system missing. Don't forget to add the variable and click continue. Now, if that looks right to you, you're gonna click okay. And guess what happens? Look at that five, it disappeared and it was replaced by dot. If you go down the list, you see another one. So now five is coded as system missing. This is only appropriate when you know it's actually missing, okay? So typically you don't wanna like code like an ethnicity like African-American into missing, you don't want that, okay? Any questions about that? Not too bad, right? We're gonna go skip the data file comments. I never use that. But it's, in general, it's good to, to write down kind of what you did. So data file comments just change, just adds a little annotation saying we recoded five to missing. I usually don't use that, but it's good to uh, write that down somewhere. So someone else could see that and be able to replicate it. It's called research rep reproducibility. Okay, let's say we want to create a sum score, right? Uh, let's say there's a test score test that's called reading, writing, and math. And we want to see what people get on that test. So we're going to sum reading, writing, and math. So we're going to go to transform, and we're going to go compute variable. I'm going to call this total. And what is it the total of? Reading plus writing plus math, okay? So it's just the sum score of all those variables. All right, look at the total score. So that is the sum, right? You can check, you can check if that's true. Like let's check the first one, 57 plus 52 plus 41, 150. Okay, so we got that, right? Not too bad. Um, now let's, we can do, we can run descriptives of that too, right? So now we can run descriptives of the same, the, this new variable that we created, right? And the mean is 157, min max 108, 211, okay? So you can treat any new variables you create as uh, this, as a, another variable. Okay, um, for the interest of time, as much as I want to go over every single slide, let's get to uh, page 71, okay? So I am going to go to page 71. And again, these slides are available to you. So if you want to go back and reference it, you can. And feel free to um, ask, email me if you have any questions. Okay, so this is an important concept. It's called standardizing a variable, okay? Standardizing means I want to make the variable mean centered. So meaning the mean is now zero and the standard deviation is now one. If that doesn't make sense to you, just think of it as a way to transform or modify your variable. 
So what we want to do is we want to create a standardized score for reading where the mean is now zero and the standard deviation is now one. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to know what the mean and standard deviation is, right? Of reading. So we're going to go to descriptives, analyze descriptive, descriptives, statistics, descriptives. We're going to go to reading. And then we get the descriptives. So you guys write this down, OK? Because um, And it should be in the slides, too. But we need the mean, and then we need the standard deviation. OK? So my mean is 52.23, and my standard deviation is 10.25. Now, SPSS will give you the standardized variables very easily. So I'm going to go to Analyze Descriptive Statistics and Descriptives. Now I'm going to check Save Standardized Variables, Values as Variables. If that doesn't make sense to you, just try it and see what happens. Look at that. So now I have a new variable called ZREAD, Z for standardized where the mean is now zero and the standard deviation is now one. Let's check if that's true. I'm going to analyze descriptives, descriptives. We're going to look at the new Z variable. Let's look at the mean, zero, standard deviation one. Does that make sense? OK, now this is just an exercise in how to transform a variable. Exercise seven, I am on page um, 72. Try to recreate the z-score manually. Actually, I already gave you the descriptives. OK, so the z-score is defined as the score minus the mean, all divided by the standard deviation. Can you guys try that? Let me know if you're stuck or you let Christine know too. I'll give you a couple of minutes to work on this. Okay. So what our goal is, is to create the z-score, right? Where the z-score is defined as the score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, right? Okay. So transform compute variable, right? Because we're creating a new variable, right? Let's call it my z read. What is the formula for the z score? It is the score minus, so the score of what? Of reading, right? So it's reading minus the mean of read. The mean of read is 52 point. Remember, we wrote that down. Now, remember our order of operations. You have to make sure that you enclose the, the plus or minus first before you divide. Now, I want to divide it by what? I want to divide it by the standard deviation, which is what? 10.25. Does that make sense? Click OK. Compare what we got, my Z read, to what SPS is given. It's pretty close, right? Okay. Anyone have questions about how to do that? Or was that too fast? OK, finally, we're going to our last section because um, we're running out of some time. I wish I could go to longer. Because uh, you guys have been having a great audience, great um, participants. Thank you so much for staying. I'm going to finish it off now with um, the last section, which is page 80. Managing data. OK. So we talked about basically how to run some descriptives. We talked about how to transform variables. 
What about the data itself? Like, let's say you want to, you get the data, maybe you get, you, if the data is too big and you want to shrink it down, maybe you want to add variables or uh, maybe you want to add cases, add observations. So what we're going to do is we're going to open a new file. Okay, so this is finally a new file. So we're going to cl close down everything and we're going to open hs1.sav. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind doing that, hs1.sav. Okay, so this is, this is a new file, okay? Uh, we've already done things like that. So we're gonna go to slide 84. So let's say we have all these variables, right? We have all these variables, and then all we wanna keep are a certain number of variables. Let's say, because a lot of times I see people have like these huge data sets, right? And they they really only analyze like five of the variables. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to file, save as, I'm on page 84, by the way, 84. Now you're gonna click on um, variables, okay? So you'll see this dialog here. Now we're gonna drop all first, okay? Drop all. And then we're gonna keep ID, female, read, and break. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna do. And let's save this as my HS1. Now I'm gonna check by opening my HS1 and look at that. So now it's a subset of the data that we just had. This is useful when you have a lot of variables and you just want to analyze a couple of them. Any questions on that? Okay. The final two concepts, and I promise we're done, is I want to talk about two important concepts called appending versus merging. And then we're done, okay? So, Let's go through what appending means. So pending is if you wanna add observations or add cases. Meaning if you have uh, 50 people and then you wanna increase it to 100, you collected the data again with 50 other people, then 50 plus 50 should equal 100, right? So you're stacking that variable on top of each other. That's called adding cases. Now, um, the requirement is you have to have the same variable names and the same number of variables, otherwise this won't work, okay? So the names have to be exactly the same. Like if you call something gender on the other one, it should be called gender on the other one, on, on, on both, right? It can't be gender on one and then female on the other. Also, you need to have the exact same number of variables or else there's nothing to append for the ones that are not the same. So we're gonna talk about um, how to append um, so let's open shmail.sav. Oops. So what are we doing here? Uh, so what we're doing is we have two data sets. We have male and then we have female. We want to append them, right? So let's see. It, uh, where I'm, I'm on page um, 85 right now of the slides, page 85. So what I wanna do is I wanna add male to female or add female to male. Right now, this only has 91 males. So what do I do? I wanna add the female, right? So I wanna go on page 87, I want data. I want to merge file, but don't don't think of it as merge yet. And then I want to go to add cases. I'm page 87 right now. What do I want to add? Well, we don't want to add anything here. We want to add a separate file. So I want to add an external SPSS file called hsfemale. What that has is 
all the females in my data set. Now, this is telling us that all the variables are the same. Remember I said it has to be, have the exact same number of variables? I don't have any unpaired variables, meaning there's not variables that are only in male, but not in female. So all the variables are the same and they're named exactly the same, right? That's what I was saying. And then I add it and I click okay. And now let's look at the number of observations. Look, it went from 91 to 200, right? That's exactly how many subjects we had. So how many um, females did it add? 200 minus 91, it added 109. Any questions about appending? Not too bad, right? Now, I'm going to go to page 88. The second and last concept is called merging. What is merging? Unlike appending, you're not stacking the, 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 the data sets on top of each other. You're kind of juxtaposing them side by side. What are the requirements of merging? The requirement is that you have to have the same key variable. So that is very important for merging is that you need what we call key variables. What is a key variable? This is in blue. A key variable, actually, let me ask you guys this. What do you think is the key variable in, uh, for our data set? If you have any ideas. You can, if, you're, if you're confused, just look at the, uh, let's look at the HS1 data set and let's think about what a key variable is. A key variable has to exist in all data sets that you're trying to merge. Can you guys kind of tell me what a key variable might be? What variable do you think can exist and should exist in all? Yes, ID, perfect. Yes, thank you. Wow, you guys are amazing. And you're amazing for sticking to the end. The key variable is ID, perfect. So in general, you want the ID to be the key variable. Now you can have a different number of variables. That's okay, because that's actually what you want, right? You want to add more variables. So you see the red is one set of variables, and then you see the orange is the second set of variables. And what you're doing is you're juxtaposing them. So unlike adding cases where you have to have the same number of variables, merging, you can have a you are supposed to have a different number of variables. The only thing the requirement is that you have the, to have the same key variable. Okay, let's show you how to do that in, H in SPSS. Uh, I'm gonna close down the male and the female. We don't need any of those. Okay, let's close down all of them because it's, it's confusing when you have too many um, data sets. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm looking at um, page um, 89 right now. We're almost done, I promise. Is we're gonna merge the demographic variable called HSDEM with the test variable, which has all the um, test uh, scores that we want. Okay, so I'm looking at page 88, 89, and I'm going to open HSDEM for demographics. Okay, so this has female and which program type they're in. Those are what we call demographic. You notice the key variable is ID. Now in old versions of SPSS, what it requires you to do is sort by the key variable. Because what it does is that once it's sorted, it'll match the rows to each other. So I can do that pretty easily by right clicking on ID and clicking on sort ascending. You see how that's sorted now? Now that's an optional thing now with modern SPSS. You don't have to because it does automatically do that for you, but this does help you understand how, how merging works. Okay, so I just sorted HSDEM demographics by the key variable. Now let's open the other one. What's the other one? HS test, right? Okay, so remember this is the test score data set. What do they have in common? ID, which is the key variable. I'm gonna sort by that too. So I right click and I say sort ascending. 
Now, which one do you want to be the first one? You can choose, right? It's the, it's the same way if you merge as dem to test versus test to dem, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna choose dem first, and then I'm gonna merge in test. So what I wanna do is I click on data. Now you can click on merge files. So it's the same merge file, but don't confuse it with add cases. Now we're gonna add variables, right? We're adding what two variables? We're adding reading and writing. Is this an open data set? Yes. HS test. Continue. Don't worry about this one to many, one to one. We're just going to say one to one based on key values. What is our key value variable? ID. Make sure that's the, the thing you see there, okay? ID is very important. Now let's look at this. Okay, let's look at this. So you see there's star by female and prog, and there's plus by reading and write. So let me go to the slides so I can kind of show you. I am on page um, 92. Okay. So the key variable has to exist in both data sets. We check that. Now, what is this plus or my plus star thing? Well, if you see this here, you see this? The star means this comes from one data set. And then plus means this comes from the other data set. Now, if you have variables um, that aren't, uh, that, sorry, um, basically you don't want anything in the excluded variables, okay? You want everything to be in included. All right, so we know that female and prog our star, which comes from HS dem, and we know that reading and write come from HS test. So we confirm that that's, that's what we expect. We expect four variables plus the ID variable. Okay, let's see if that's true. So let's do that in SPSS. Let's click OK. So we have four variables plus the key variable, right? And they're sorted, see that, by ID? Now, this is our last exercise, and I think we're done. This is our last exercise. It's not too bad. Um, and then we have a poll. Okay, open the original HS dem and the HS test. What does the missing data mean? So you see that there's missing data now? What do you think that means? Well, let's see. Uh, I don't want to, oh, actually that's that's hard to open the original data. So we're going to save this first. Uh, I'm going to call it my merge. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is open HS dem. I'm going to compare that to HS test. Okay, so on your own, maybe just try to like compare which IDs do you think are missing? Key is to sort it, okay, sort it first. And then I'll pretty much go over it. But that's all you have to do is open those two data sets. Okay, um, so Let's look at that missing one for female and proc. Okay, that says that it's missing for ID 10, right? So where does, um, why is it missing for ID 10? What does it mean? What, what, what ID is missing? What, var what data set does it come from? So what it comes from is the test one, right? So the ID 10 comes from the test one. The, the test one has ID 10. So you see, um, you see what I'm saying there? So the test one has ID 10, but the DEM one does not, right? Now let's look at ID 4. So the DEM one has ID 4, but the test one does not, okay? So that's how you know um, for certain IDs, 
there's missing data. So it's in one, but not the other. Okay, so just be careful when you have missing data. It just means um, you haven't merged it perfectly. If you merged it perfectly, every ID would have all the variables. Okay, now finally, we're gonna have our last, last poll. Last poll, if you don't mind. Uh, oops. Last, last poll. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go to. All right. So this is the last poll. And number one says merging is appropriate when you want to add cases. Number two, appending is appropriate when you have two data sets with the same number of variables with the same variable names. I think this should be pretty straightforward. Okay, so maybe one was kind of hard because um, merging is not appropriate when you want to add cases. Okay, uh, number two, all of you got correctly. Um, so I'll show you why merging is not appropriate. So uh, let's go back to this PowerPoint. Uh, let's go to, okay. So let's look at actually appending first. So let's go to page 86. And what I sh show you is that appending is appropriate when you wanna add cases, why? Because you wanna stack them, right? You wanna have mail, like this is your um, male, right? And this is your female. So male has 91 and female has 109, right? And then we get 200, total N is 200. So appending is when you wanna stack the observations from uh, top and bottom right here. Now merging, is when you have the same number of observations, but you want to add variables, right? So this is like, um, what is it? Uh, fem female and prog. And then this is um, science and I think it was math or something. Reading and write, sorry. This was reading and writing, right? Does that make sense? So we have the same number of observations, but we want to add these variables together. So just to recap, appending is appropriate for adding cases and merging is appropriate for adding variables. Okay, so hopefully that clarifies that for you. And I just want to conclude. Um, this, thank you all for coming to the seminar, by the way. Uh, thank you for your patience and, and staying to the very end. Uh, I know you guys have very busy schedules, so thank you for your time. But basically what you've learned so far is how to get data into SPSS, how to run some basic descriptives of your data, mean, standard deviation, et cetera, frequencies, create visualiz visualizations of those descriptives like scatter plot, histogram, box plot, how to create sum scores, uh, we haven't actually, unfortunately, we didn't talk about how to uh, convert categorical variables. We didn't have time for that. And then finally, you learned about adding cases and adding variables, merging and appending. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful for you. Now, if, I, if you could do me one last favor, is if you could provide some feedback for me, that would be very helpful so that I can improve the seminar for future appendees. And the, the, the link is, in the final section, final slide. And maybe I will also paste this into the chat. So if you don't mind spending just like two or three minutes of your time filling out that survey, I would totally appreciate that. And thank you so much for your time and hopefully that was helpful for you. Uh, if you have any questions uh, beyond this, thank you so much. Um, thanks, Stephanie. So yeah. If you have any other questions, just feel free to stay after and I can answer them for, and Christine can answer them for you, okay?